help voters understand who you are a little bit about yourself, both personally and professionally. Well, thank you both for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Diego Morales, uh, the son of legal immigrants who came to America. Uh, respecting the rule of law, we settled down uh, by the Ohio River in Clark County, Indiana. So we came simply uh, chasing that precious American dream. That American dream that most people look for coming to America. We had the opportunity, but we came to America to give, to contribute, to be productive citizens. And that's one of the things that uh, uh, you know, my family and I are very proud to call ourselves now proud Americans, proud Hoosiers, and we look forward to, you know, to continue to give back to this state that we love. Um, would you share an interesting fact about yourself that folks won't find in your official bio? <laughs> well, there are a few, a few facts. First of all, I love coffee. You know, just coffee, it's a must. I love coffee. Uh, I, sometimes I tell people that, uh, I, uh, you know, I drink like a gallon of coffee every day because that coffee and water, coffee and water. But also I'm a runner. I like to run. I like to stay in shape. Uh, so uh, those are the two things that I actually enjoy uh, doing. And even though during the campaign, long hours, long days, uh, still, uh, you know, when I get home, I still uh, get my uh, two or three miles run every day. Why are you running to be Indiana's next Secretary of State? Simply to repay my debt of gratitude to Indiana and America that has given me everything. You know, when I uh, came to America, as I said earlier, I established, uh, my family and I, we established ourselves in, to me, the best small town in America, Salisbury, Indiana, in Clark County. Everyone else, were so kind to me. Do you, know, Bo, do you know how much English I knew when I arrived in America? Zero, nothing, nada. So I started from scratch, and I saw how Hoosiers came to, to help me, to encourage me, to, you know, to say, Diego, you can go to college, learn the language, and I will never forget that. I've been seeing the heart of Hoosiers, not only in Clark County, but in the other 91 counties across the state. So I owe it to all of you. I want to continue to give back. And I believe by giving back, running for Secretary of State, it is, it is very important because to me, I'm living the American dream and protecting the American dream, I believe starts at the ballot box, at the polls. So for everyone else, they can have the opportunity to be part of the process, part of the election process. So protecting that precious American dream that I'm living starts at the ballot box, at the polls, and that is precisely why I'm running. If elected Secretary of State, what is your top priority? Where are you going to focus your energy first? So the responsibilities for the Secretary of State's office are four, elect the election division, the business division, the auto dealers division, and the securities division. Let me start with the election division. One of my goals, Bob, is to strengthen, to protect and expand photo ID laws. I want to make sure, you know, here in Indiana, we have a law that when you go to the polls, you show an ID, right? I want to protect it and expand it. So when it comes to voting, everyone needs to show an ID when it comes to all forms of voting. Number two, I like to push back on the federal government, working with our federal partners in Congress to push back so the federal government will not federalize and nationalize our elections. The Democrats want to federalize and nationalize our elections, and that's something that I disagree with. So those are the top things that I will do when it comes to, election, when it comes to elections. I'm all about and, election and integrity, election security. My motto has always been easy to vote, harder to cheat. Easy to vote, harder to cheat. Thank you. Number two, and, I, and again, I want to, there, there's a lot of things to do in the Secretary of State's office, so I, I really wanted to hit on what's your top priority, like the, the one or two things. So you've, you've talked about a couple already. Did you cover the things that are most important to you? These are the top two things under the election division. Now, under the business division, 
I like to make the business division a true one-stop shop for all business owners in Indiana. For example, I like to bring uh, tax services, license uh, the li licensing services, and as well as well as I like to make sure you know bring the certifications under the business division of the Secretary of State's office. So we can help our small business owners to be more efficient. Under the auto dealers division, I've been visiting with auto dealers, I like to help them get their license plate, license plate and registration issued in an efficient manner. And on the fourth one, which is the securities division, I like to focus on financial literacy one of my goals is to help our children how to make smart investments. And also, you know, that we have a growing elderly population here in Indiana. I want to help them to avoid scams, to avoid any types of scams. So those are uh, the four divisions and those are my main, uh, my, main, my main policy items that I like to implement under each division of the Secretary of State's office. Elections, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of different things that, as you just mentioned, that the Secretary of State does. A lot of the focus on this particular Secretary of State election is on, on voting and voter registration. So the next several questions are going to be about that. Um, how can Indiana improve its elections, and what role does Secretary of State play in that? Well, you know, we, we have actually uh, one of my goals is to focus a lot on increasing voter confidence through education. Education, education, education. You know, I like to help bring awareness to our fellow Hoosiers to be part of the process. Let me give you an example. When I uh, became a naturalized citizen myself, it took me almost 10 years to become a naturalized citizen. I went through the process, you know, I pay thousands of dollars for those applications. I actually study uh, hundreds of questions to take a civic test. So when I rose my right hand to become a naturalized citizen, it was one of the greatest days of my life. You know what I did, Bob, that day? As soon as I left the courthouse, I went to register to vote immediately. And ever since, I haven't missed any. I've been going to vote every single time. Mm. So one of my goals is, should I be blessed to be your next Secretary of State here in three weeks? I like to implement uh, a lot of education. For example, I like to go to the naturalization ceremonies here in Indianapolis and across the state and be there with my team ready to register newly American citizens. What I've been doing this summer, I've been going, you know, I was at the Indiana Latino Expo, I've been at the Indiana Latino, uh, yeah, Indiana Latino Expo, at the Black Expo. I've been registering voters. I've been going encouraging the, uh, the mi minorities within the minority community to be part of the process. Look, I'm a proud American, but I will never shy away of my roots and heritage. I'm a proud Hispanic Latino, and I've been encouraging my community to be part of the process. So I've been going to, to their expo, registering voters, same with the Black Expo, because I want them to be part of the process. It is their right, you know, to have that, to me, that honor and privilege to go to the polls and vote. Now, so, uh, and my next question for you is very much along those lines. Uh, Indiana historically has a very low registered voter turnout. Is that worrisome to you, and what would you do to change that? Well, y usually, you know, in a non-presidential election, it's a lower, you know, presidential, it may be a little bit higher. Sometimes it's driven by policy and candidates, as you know. Uh, but at the same time, one of my goals I'm already doing that actually. So I've been visiting high schools, you know, so when I get invited and speak to seniors in high schools, I ask them, how many of you will be 18 on election day? Raise your hand. And a few people raise, raise their hand. And, I, and, I, and then I ask them, do you know that you can register to vote now? Because you will be 18 before 
you know, election day? And they said, no, I did not know that. So we're bringing awareness to the next generation of Hoosiers. And that's something that one of my goals is to revamp and start, you know, an educational campaign and to tell our fellow Hoosiers how important it is to be part of the process. You know, I would like to visit more high schoolers, more high schools, colleges, and I'd like to partner as well with other offices. It is time for us to really bring as much awareness as possible to our fellow Hoosiers so they can be part of the process, so they can register to vote, and they can get out there to vote. Are Indiana elections secure? Yes, our, our elections are better than most other uh, states, such as Pennsylvania or Georgia. Indiana is doing, uh, is, doing, uh, is doing better. However, there is room for improvement. And that's something that I like to focus on. I like to build from where our leaders have, uh, you know, ha have left it off. And I like to take it to the next level. So that way we can be a model for more states across the nation. How do you do that? Well, f for example, as I said, one of the things is to increase voter confidence. And I think I explained to you why you know, I like to go to the high schools. I like to start focusing on educational campaigns when it comes to voting. I like to, I'm gonna be a very active, again, should I be blessed to be your next Secretary of State in three weeks? I'm going to be active in the community. Like I say, I, I'm already doing this during the summer. I've been going to the minority community. And that's something that I really want to focus and go into them and say, look, your vote matters. Your How vote does counts. that make elections more secure? The question is, what specifically would you do to help make Indiana elections more secure? You said you'd like to improve upon the system. So we, we are going, as I said earlier, we are going to continue to protect and expand photo ID laws. I believe photo ID laws, it's a key to keep our elections safe and secure. I believe by pushing back on the Democrats that wants to federalize and nationalize our elections is key as well because uh, I'm against same day voter registration. I'm against automatic voter registration. So those are the type of things that I believe it will help, uh, you know, uh, secure our elections if we push back on, on those items. If you would, please expand. You said you'd like to expand photo ID laws. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that in all forms of voting, for, for example, mail-in absentee, mail-in voting, that's part of it. This year, um, above the Indiana General Assembly, they passed a law that it requires you now to put the last four digits of your social or driver license number, you know, when, requ when you request an absentee, if you want to, po to vote by mail. Uh, I believe it's a good start, but I would like to see if, uh, you know, when you go to the polls on election day, or even early, like, like right now, we're underway to vote, right? So if you go to the, to the city building to vote, when you arrive there, you show your ID. So why not, if you want to vote, you know, via mail-in, so you can perhaps attach a copy of your photo ID, so that way I know that is Bob, and then we, that's, those are some of the ways that we can keep our elections safe and secure by knowing who you are. So you'd like to see attaching a photo ID to all uh, mail and absentee ballots to be required. That will be one. That will be yes. That will be one of the the ideas to do that. Okay. To make it more safe and secure. And I think it's just common sense. As I said, if you show your ID when you go to the polls, why not in all other forms of voting? All we're asking is, you know, like I said, transparency. Um, do you believe it's too easy to vote in Indiana or too difficult to vote in Indiana right now? No, I think uh, everybody has the opportunity to vote. Look, we have uh, almost a month to, to, get to, the, to get to the polls and vote. Like, like I said, like today, anybody can go there on their lunch time. We have two Saturdays before election day for everyone to go. If you're working, let's say you cannot get out from work Monday through Friday. So you can go either two Saturdays before. I believe is working 
and uh, everyone has an opportunity to vote. So uh, I believe it, it, it's working. As Secretary of State, would you continue having four weeks before the election to cast a vote early, or would you rather see that time period shortened? It is working the way it is, and it will continue to stay uh, the same. Any election loss that it may pass in the future, it will be working in conjunction with the General Assembly. The General Assembly, as you know, they are the ones who will pass those election laws. So, um, you know, I look forward to working with them if they want to pass any election laws in the future. Obviously, the Secretary of State's office does a lot more than voting. You touched on this uh, a little while ago. Um, would you like to talk again? You, you mentioned in the business division, one-stop shopping, um, financial literacy, and, and helping seniors to avoid scams are important to you. Are there other things that you would like to do in other areas of the Secretary of State's office? You know, one of the things that I really like to focus on in addition to this is to make sure start opening the doors and perhaps creating hope for specifically for the minority community so with they, if they can see that Diego Morales a legal immigrant who came to America um, you know chasing the American dream perhaps be the next Secretary of State I think we're able to encourage then you know others, other minorities to follow that lead. They may be the ones who can be the next mayors, the, maybe the next mayor of Indianapolis, maybe the next congressman, maybe the next governor, heck, maybe even the next president, you know. Uh, what I'm doing here, I'm just trying to open in the doors and creating some hope uh, for the next generation of Hoosiers. You know, um, it's never been about me, Bob. I, I never run uh, simply for to, to be someone. I don't want to be important. It's always been about doing some important things. And, and you know, now that you ask this, growing up I uh, asked, uh, you know, other leaders, uh, may I say mature seasoned leaders within my community, the Hispanic Latino community, and I said, why don't you guys run for office? And the first answer that I got is like, oh no, I'm not going because politics is dirty and nasty and they go after you, they accuse you of everything and then uh, you're there. So I don't want to put myself there. So I said, but if you don't do it, then who? Then who? And, you know, as a man of faith myself, uh, I feel I've been guided to do this at such a time as this. And that is why I'm doing, you know, this and I should hope I can, you know, perhaps encourage or motivate others out there so they can see me, they may say, well, if this Diego guy is able to do it, why not me? Um, want to ask you about the 2020 election. Was Joe Biden fairly legally elected president of the United States? Yes, Joe Biden is the president of our great country. He is in the White House, as you know. Although may I add this, Bob, uh, he, he, he's doing a horrible job. Uh, look, at, uh, look at the inflation going to the roofs. Look, look at the gas prices. You know, crisscrossing all 92 counties, what I hear from my fellow Hoosiers is, how am I going to pay a gallon of gas at the pump? How am I going to bring food on the table? How am I going to pay bills? Now the winter is coming. People are concerned about this, about our economy. Joe Biden is the president, he's in the White House. Although my question though is, was he fairly and legally elected, he, is my question. He is the legitimate president. Okay. So leading up to winning your party's nomination, a big part of your platform was claiming that the 2020 election was a scam. And now it seems that you're walking that back. Why is that? Well, here is, exa here is exactly what I said. And I gave an example, and I should hope uh, now that we have the time, you can hear on, on, on my example. When I gave this example is because in the 2020 election, the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, the Pennsylvania Secretary of State changed election laws 30 days 
before the presidential election. That, who, who does that? So that what, what change was made specifically? That people are able to register, people are able to register to vote, people are able to vote easily. Here in Indiana, as I said, any election last that we will make, it has to go through the General Assembly in advance, not 30 days before. And by the way, no one person should have the power to make those changes. It has to be working in conjunction with the General Assembly. So those are the type of examples I said that there were irregularities during that election. But also I've been clear, Joe Biden is the president, he's in the White House, and look, people. Let, let, let me sure. share with you some other things that you said. Sure. So Hoosier conservative voices quoted you in April 2021 as saying, if we count every legal vote, President Trump won this election. And you retweeted that. What did you mean by, if we count every legal vote, President Trump won the election? Well, we all should be counting every single legal vote here in Indiana. That's part of the process. And do you feel that wasn't the case? Well, we, I believe they count our, all of our elected officials here who were in the Secretary of State's office, including our wonderful county clerks. They did their, they did their job. Uh, I believe, as I said, other states, they, again, I don't live in other states, but that's what I was giving you the example of, the Pens of Pennsylvania. But I believe in Indiana, we're doing our job, our elected officials are doing our job. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in other states, it was not the case, such as the example that I gave you from Pennsylvania. But you said that if we count every legal vote, so are you saying that there were illegal votes that were counted? That's, that's what you're basically saying or insinuating there is that President Trump lost only because there were illegal votes counted. Do you feel that way? No, I, th I think, uh, as I said, Joe Biden is the president. He is there. He won. He's there. And we all need to move on from all of that. We need to start focusing on the future, you know, like on these 2022 elections and then on the 2024 elections. For example, I disagree personally. I did not vote for Joe Biden, but he's there. I look forward to work with whoever our nominee will be in 2024 to retake back the White House. You're going to be, if elected, the head of elections in Indiana. And, and you, on June 2nd of this year, you retweet an endorsement of you that called the 2020 election fundamentally tainted. Why do you believe the 2020 election was fundamentally tainted? Well, in, 20, in 2016, many Democrats were saying the same thing, and no one calls them into question. Even in 2018, uh, Stacey Abrams, she's still doing that. She never accepted her elections. No one is saying anything about them. You know, and she's, she's been repeatedly questioned about those statements and been made to answer. So I'm, I'm asking you the same thing because there have been recounts, there have been audits, there have been countless lawsuits. They all found the same thing. There was no scam, there was no fraud with the 2020 election. And this March you wrote an op-ed, and I wanna quote what you wrote. You said that you maintain deep skepticism regarding the accuracy of the 2020 election. We have valid reasons to doubt the official vote tallies in key states. And you said, let me make my own position on 2020 crystal clear. The 2020 election was flawed and the citizens of Indiana, uh, excuse me, the 2020 election was flawed and the outcome is questionable and you call the election a scam that was perpetrated on the citizens of Indiana and against all Americans. These are your own words. So Mr. Morales, what I'm asking you is the words that you've said helped you get your party's nomination for Secretary of State, and now you seem to be running away from those words. No, what Why I, is that? Well, what I said, as I said, I gave you the example of the Pennsylvania Secretary of State. Exactly, precisely why I use those words, because I believe no one person should have the power to change any election last 30 days before a presidential election. This needs to be done way before that in conjunction working with each General Assembly. Unfortunately, they did not do that in Pennsylvania. 
that's exactly what I'm talking about, and this is exactly why I wrote this, because I'm not going to let that happen here in Indiana, as I said earlier. Any election laws that we will make in the future, it has to be working with the General Assembly, with a bipartisan General Assembly. That, that's the way it has to be done. I don't want to be the guy who has the power just to go there and change change. No, I don't want to be that guy. And no one should have that power, quite honestly. That's why we have a, bal uh, a balance of, of a check and balances of powers. You know, we have the executive, the legislative, the judicial. So I want to work with all of them to do that. So when I use those words, that's specifically stating on what happened in Pennsylvania. And it makes you believe, to clarify, it makes you believe that there are questions and you doubt the outcome of the 2020 election and its legitimacy. Is that correct? Indiana is running good elections and I'm going to continue to do that. What happened in Pennsylvania, I don't think it should happen. I don't think they should have changed election last 30 days before. And I maintain that no one should have power to change any election last before that. I will not do that. I will always look forward to working with our General Assembly in conjunction working with them to pass any election laws. Let's move on. Mr. Moore said he supports a statewide election audit in all 92 counties after each election. Um, your opponent, Ms. Wells, does not favor that. She thinks it's too expensive and not necessary. What is your position on a statewide audit of elections? I'm in favor of, in favor of that, absolutely. At, listen, even in business, so as a small business owner, you know, when they audit uh, your business, you have, you, you're like, okay, come and audit my business because you have nothing to hide, right? So they audit your business, everything's good, and then you move on. Same, even when you go to a new office, you audit and you see what's working, what's not working, and you make those changes. That's the purpose of that. So I'm absolutely in favor to, to do that. Same, it applies to our elections. You know, we need to audit our elections to see what's working, what's not working. Let me clarify something here. Not to find blame on anybody. No, let me be clear. Our county clerks are doing a wonderful job. I've been visiting with them all over the 92 counties. I've been meeting with them and I've been telling them, my job will be to give them the tools and resources they need to continue to run those elections in their counties efficiently. They know better how to run those elections because they live in their counties. So I just want to be a resource to them. Uh, but in order to do that, we can do this as well. So I don't see any problem with that. I think, I think it's a good thing simply to make sure to rectify what's working, what's not working. Um, I want to ask you about another comment that uh, Mr. Moore said when asked if fraud is a concern in Indiana. Uh, Mr. Moore recently replied, voter fraud happens all the time. Do you agree with that statement? So I can give you a, a few examples, actually. Um, there is, a, a, you know, a case that happened in Knox County in Vincennes, Indiana, you know, that uh, someone was trying to vote. Uh, thank goodness the county clerk cut that and they rectified it. Uh, another instance when some people illegally were trying to vote, uh, for example, you know, before, and the way they got this, uh, they actually, they saw this is happening is because some people were trying to apply for their citizenship. And as you know, when you apply for your citizenship, you go through a very rigorous background check. So that's when they find out that some people, they were already uh, voted you know, in our elections. And that's something that, I'll, again, I like to work to rectify this working in conjunction with the BNB. So we need to make sure issue, you know, driver license to only, you know, citizens, US citizens, if you will, so they're able to vote. So there have been instances and cases here in Indiana, like the ones that I just explained to you, uh, but it, it's minimum. But to me, even if it's one, it's a lot. So that's the point. We need to look for ways how we can rectify that. And, and one of my goals is to work very closely with the BNB so we can rectify those issues. Um, in your op-ed, you wrote that you'd like to reform Indiana's voting rules by mandating that every Hoosier vote in person, if possible, with exceptions for those who cannot physically get to the polls. 
Indiana currently has 11 exemptions that allow voters to vote absentee by mail. As Secretary of State, would you keep all 11 of those exceptions or would you get rid of some of them? Yes, the 11 are, are actually working. Uh, you know, if you're serving in the military overseas, for example, you should have the opportunity to vote. You're risking your life out there, right? If you're ill, if you're in the hospital, if you're sick, if you're disabled, if you're working, for example, I've been in the, in the logistics industry, like I see truckers delivering food on election day. Of course, they need an opportunity to vote orally. So we're gonna keep them the same and we're gonna continue to make sure that every single Hoosier have the opportunity to vote. Thank you. Um, there have been several controversies that have come up during the campaign and I'd like to give you a chance to address some of those. Um, uh, a, a local political blog recently posted transcripts from interviews with two women who claimed that they were sexually assaulted by you over a decade ago. Um, as of now, the women have not been identified. 13 News has not spoken to those women. How do you respond to the allegations against you? You know, this is completely false and untruthful. This is an attack to smear and slander my good name. You know, this comes, these anonymous sources comes on a blog run by gossip, rumors, and innuendo. So, you know, this is completely false and untruthful. I'm actually insulted by this, that people are trying to use this against me for political gains, for it's all about, you know, politics. You know, shame on these people who are doing this against me. Because these people have no ideas. They have no vision. They have no policy items. So shame on them. Are you saying that these women are lying? As I said, these are untruthful. These are anonymous sources, but run on a blog that, you know, or this blog runs rumors, innuendos, gossip. I'm sure your station would not run that, right? I'm sure they will not run anonymous sources like what this blog is doing. Um, one of your opponents referred to the allegation as very serious. Um, your Democratic challenger, Destiny Wells, referred to you earlier this week as a sexual predator. What, what do you say to those comments by your challengers? You know, the Democrats, this is their playbook because they have no ideas. They have no vision. They have no story to tell. They don't have my story like it is the American dream. So they have to smear people's name. They're smearing my name because they cannot compete with me in every level. I, I'm, I'm out working everybody. I'm crisscrossing all 92 counties seven days a week, day in, day out. So I feel, you know, I tell you what, I'm insulted by them, but that's what it tells you because then they cannot compete with me head to head. But you know what? Hoosiers across the state of Indiana, they know me, they know me who I am, and, you know, I will let them decide. But I tell my fellow Hoosiers, do not cave into the Democrat playbook. This has always been their playbook, smearing people's names, slandering people's names. And that's what they're doing to me. But you know what? They will never break my spirit. I am even working harder, and I'm gonna continue to, to work hard the next three weeks. And I am going to continue to do that. But I'm insulted by this. Shame on the Democrats. Shame on the Democrat candidates saying all of this. A quarterly campaign finance report shows that you spent about $44,000 to buy a new SUV with campaign funds. Your opponents have been critical of that. Do you see anything wrong with it? Nothing wrong with that. I'm a grassroots person. Since day one, I said that I'm going to crisscross all 92 counties. In fact, many counties I have visited several times, several times. So this is actually, you know, a modest car, good use of my generous donors. In fact, 
my generous donors agree with this. Has the Democrat donated to me? No. Has people, the liberals have donated to me? No. This is private money for my generous donors. Nothing wrong with this. I invite the Democrats and other people, if they're willing to crisscross the 92 counties, I invite them to raise their own cash, buy a car, and crisscross the 92 counties. Many other campaigns have done this. This is actually, uh, many people do this for a successful campaign. This is standard for a successful campaign. Um, and I've, I've heard some folks suggest that this is a way for you to personally enrich yourself. What's going to happen to that vehicle when your campaign is over? What's going to happen, we say this is day one, after the campaign is over, we're gonna sell it, and then the campaign will go to the campaign account. So I'm gonna have more cash on hand after this because we're gonna sell it and we're gonna have more money. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, Bob, when I announced running for you know, Secretary of State to convention day, I put 150,000 miles in my own car. Basically, I burned a, ca a car. And then when we got the campaign car, we're already over 27,000 miles. Mm. So again, every successful campaign can do this, and that's why I invite the Democrats to do this. But you know what they're not doing? Because they're not willing to work hard. I'm the only candidate who has crisscrossed several, several times all 92 counties because I'm a grassroots in nature, and I'm gonna continue to do that. Thank you. Um, you served in the military. There have been multiple media reports raising questions about your military service. What would you like voters to know about your military service? You know, what I want my fellow Hoosiers to know that I served honorably. By the way, I'm insulted by, by the Democrats and some journalists in the media that they're trying to question my military service when I was the one who volunteered and enlisted in the U.S. military with a green card in my wallet. You know, as I said, I came to America to give. So with a green card in my wallet, I went to volunteer and enlisted simply to show my love and gratitude to America that has given me everything. I was there ready to put my life on the line if needed, if needed. So when people are questioning my military service, I'm insulted. And I tell my fellow Hoosier veterans here in Indiana, do not listen to the Democrats. Again, that's their playbook to question my service. When we provided, I believe you have, we share with you my DD-214 and my NGB-22, clearly states that I left, you know, uh, the military honorably that I served honorably, and the NGB 22, it states the years that I served. So I don't know why the Democrats and the liberals keep using this when I have a record of service to my country and I am proud to have served and have worn the uniform for this great country. Thank you for addressing that. You worked in the Secretary of State's office uh, over a decade ago. Personnel records show you were terminated for lack of focus and inefficient execution of assigned deliverables. And then two years later, when you worked at the Secretary of State's office again, um, you left again um, with a poor performance review in your personnel file. And now you're seeking to run that office. Help explain what happened back then. Anybody who knows me, they know me that I work hard, that my work ethics is uh, it's, uh, it's compared to none, I tell you this. I'm proud of my record serving in the Secretary of State's office under my good friend, Tal Rokia. You know, before that, Bob, as I said earlier, I started from scratch. So when people accuse me of lack of focus, I just won a convention through hard work. And even before that, I was working two jobs to pay for my college, two jobs to pay for my MBA, for my international MBA, volunteering in the, in the US military, started my small business, served in state government. So, 
Tad Rukira actually has clarified this, and I believe we have sent you as well a letter that Tad Rukira has shared with me before the convention, and we share that with delegates, stating that I left his office in good terms, and that he and I are lifelong friends. After the convention, Tad Rukira and another former Secretary of State, they co-authored an op-ed and we made it, we send it to everybody else. But no one <laughs> wants to print it because that Rokira clearly stay, states why he's supporting me. A couple weeks ago, he, uh, he ha uh, highlighted uh, a fundraising for me. He was a headline, he headlined a fundraising for me. And just this past week, he was at another fundraising with me. So I hope the media, the print media and everybody else will print Taro Kira's letter and, and his op-ed in support of me, telling others why. So we can put this to rest. Again, the Democrats keep using this because they know they cannot compete with me head to head. Because they have the Democrats have no ideas, no vision. They have no story to tell. But I'll tell you here, I'm proud of my record in the office, and I look forward to working uh, with the Attorney General. And I'm, I'm curious to know why you think these are, are specifically Democratic smears against your record. It's political motivated because they have no vision, they have no ideas, they have no story to tell. Look, how many times have you heard me saying something bad about anybody, about even the Democrats? I'm answering when you ask me. I'm here to talk about my vision, my qualifications, and why me? I believe Hoosiers are tired of all of this negativity, all of this smear against others, of all of this, this is all political motivated. And I want to tell my fellow Hoosiers here today, I'm not going to play those games. I came to America legally as a legal immigrant. I'm grateful for this great country and this great state, and I want to give back. I want to be a productive citizen to give back and I want to make sure I'm gonna fight for every single Hoosier here in Indiana. But I'm not gonna play the same games as the Democrats are doing, because this is clearly political motivated against me to smear and slander my good name. We're better than that, Bob. We're better than that. We need to talk about more, you know, about encouraging, motivating the next generation of Hoosiers. You heard me. Should I be, you know, uh, your, your next Secretary of State in three weeks? I will be the first immigrant Hispanic Latino Secretary of State in Indiana's history. And, and I believe, as far as I know, in the nation, as the first uh, immigrant, legal immigrant Hispanic Latino Secretary of State in the nation, if elected. So those are the type of things that we need to tell others. And you ask me if that's not progress. That is progress, and it's gonna come from Indiana. You know, people talk about the, you know, diversity and inclusion. I'm a minority running statewide, Hispanic, Hispanic Latino running statewide. I know the state very well. I want to open the doors and create hope for everyone. I want to share with others that the American dream is still alive and well in Indiana if, if they don't, if, if, that they can look at my little life. I truly believe I'm living the American dream, Bob, and that's what I want to continue to focus. Look, it hasn't come easy to me. When I came to America, I knew zero English. I started from scratch. I have always worked two jobs to be at where I am. No one paid for my education. No one has given me anything. I went many days without maybe only eating one meal a day. I was more concerned and worried about how to pay my next semester of college. I was more concerned about how am I going to do to pay the bills. But I knew that only in this country can, you can take risks. And if you can take risks, you may be successful. Well, if, and if not, well, you go back to where you were, right? But you have to take risks. I believe only in America you can be anything if you're willing to work hard and sacrifice. But you have to work hard. And that's been my message, the American dream, protecting the American dream, preserving that American dream. I pay no attention to this nonsense that others. 
I, like I said, I want to give back, and that's what I'm focusing on. I appreciate that response, because my next question was, if elected, you'd be the first Hispanic candidate elected to statewide office, and I wanted you to, to speak about what that meant to you, and I think you just did that very eloquently, so I appreciate that. It, it meant, and I tell you this, because I, as I've been visiting uh, high, school, high schools, as I said, I see, uh, for, I'll give you an example. When I went to Silver Creek High School in Salisbury, Indiana, when I arrived in America, I was the only Hispanic Latino in my high school. And my two little sisters, the same. They were the only Latinas, you know, in, you know, in elementary school. So now when I go back, when my teachers call me and they say, Diego, look, we have more Latinos here. We would like for you to come and speak to them. And, and I've been invited as well in other schools throughout the state. Mm -hmm. Would you come and encourage them and share with them your story? Many of them have the same story as you, uh, as you have. And you know, I take every opportunity to do that because again, I want everyone to be encouraged that they can be anything if they're willing to work hard and sacrifice, but it's not gonna come easy. Mm -hmm. Again, I have suffered since day one, when I arrived here in 1999 to today, all I've been doing is work, 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 you know? And I'm gonna continue to do that because I believe I've been guided to do this at such a time as this. I've heard you in interviews um, describe yourself as a businessman, an entrepreneur, and someone who created jobs. Give us some specifics, if you would. What companies have you started? What were those companies all about? And how many jobs have you created? So in uh, 2000, uh, more than 10 years ago, I created, I started my first business. So I went to buy and lease school buses. Do you see these yellow buses picking up your children from school to, I'm sorry, from home to school and then back home? So I was in that business. I, I remember my first business, I created four jobs, the first, my, my first business. You tell me, four jobs are four jobs, even if it's one, you know. And then I started in that business, so I was the CEO, the trainer, the bookkeeper. I was doing it all. I need to go and recruit my drivers to drive these school buses. And uh, it, it was a great experience. And to, I tell you this, the reason why I ended up going to pursue my MBA at, you know, obviously uh, at Purdue University was because I was already in that business. And I said, you know what? I was considering on going to law school, by the way, but then when I was working in that business, I said, I think it's best for me to pursue an MBA because this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started over 10 years ago. And then now I have moved on into other industries, such as the property management service. What I mean by that is that we service, so during now, today, this morning is cold, right? And it's gonna get even colder. So we do, we do the snow removal to commercial properties yep. during the winter. And then during the summer, we do all the lawn care. And now we have expanded into the staffing industry. You know, so we obviously put people to work. So when uh, a warehouse calls, uh, calls me and says, Diego, we're looking for forklift drivers or food package, packaging. That's when we come and that's what I do for a living. That's how I pay the bills. Mm -hmm. That's how I bring food on the table. And quite frankly, that's what it allows me to crisscross all 92 counties. You know, because I'm able to, you know, support my family. You know, I'm blessed to be married to my beautiful wife, uh, Sidonia, and my daughter. I have a beautiful wife and my beautiful daughter. And by the way, my wife is the most supportive person. She's like my biggest cheerleader. I I'll tell you this, Bob. My wife goes with me uh, sometimes to these political dinners. And many times she's, she's driving me while I'm on the phone you know, asking for support, asking for, mm -hmm. for donations, right? Uh, so we're, we're a team, we're doing this together. Uh, and then, but also this is the way, you know, we're allowed to crisscross the 92 counties 
coming from the private sector. So uh, again, with the, I mean, by the way, after you know, I got as well an international MBA. I was able to study overseas, you know, all over the world to learn how to do businesses, you know, with many other countries. And that's something that I like to to bring back under the business division of the Secretary of State's office. Yeah. I like to w work hopefully with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, IDC, so we can tag team and we can attract more investment to Indiana. Okay. So my, I guess my, my vision is big, my goal is big, and we will find out here in three weeks, uh, Bob, uh, but I'm, I'm excited. And my last question for you is uh, wrap things up. Explain why voters should cast their vote for you and why you're the best candidate. Well, if you combine, as I said earlier, my name is Diego Morales, and if you combine my education, my military service, my government service, my, uh, you know, my private sector experience, humbly, I am qualified to be your next Secretary of State. I've been preparing myself for this job for years, not just at the beginning of these years. You know, I did not wake up earlier this year, scratching my head saying, you know what, I'm gonna run for Secretary of State. I've been preparing myself for years. And I believe that I'm truly living the American dream. Should I be blessed to be your next Secretary of State? And I ask my fellow Hoosiers humbly to vote for Diego Morales for Secretary of State this fall, this November 8th. Look, we are going to open the doors and create more hope for everyone. And we're gonna send a strong message to the nation that Indiana is a special place, that you can be anything if you're willing to work hard and sacrifice. I believe I'm living the American dream, Bob. I do, but it hasn't come easy. It's been very hard, but there is nothing easy in, in, in life. My story, is not even possible anywhere around the world. I don't care Europe or anywhere. Only in America you can be anything if you're willing to work hard and sacrifice. So I want my fellow Hoosiers to know that I will work as hard as I can to make sure that Indiana is a special place, to continue to be a special place, to raise a family, and to have the opportunities to be successful and be prosperous.